Good evening. It's Wednesday night. Wednesday night Bible study. If you got your uh, Bibles out now, get your Bibles out. We're going to turn to the book of James. Uh, we're going to be in chapter, we're moving into chapter three uh, of our series, Faith That Works. And uh, so it's going to be a great, great, I hope you're having a fall, good fall, y'all. Hope everybody's feeling very blessed. Oh, I might. Thank you, Roger. Thank you for, thanks for reminding me. I'm not going to repeat all that, but hey, I hope you're having a wonderful fall, y'all. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I continue to forget to turn on the mic so many times. Uh, yeah, maybe it's because my mom always told me to keep it down, right? So maybe, yeah, as I was growing up, keep it down, Curtis, you're too loud. So, uh, yeah, but I'm really excited about tonight's uh, Bible study. That's in James chapter 3. And uh, we've, been, we've been working through James uh, slowly but surely, but there's so much in it. Um, G, uh, James, as he goes through these first three uh, chapters, he's talking about um, uh, the characteristics of, of a mature Christian. Um, and so when we, we looked at characteristic one, chapter one of James, and he talked about the, the mature Christian is patient in trouble. In other words, we allow God to begin to work in and through all the challenges that we face. Uh, characteristic two of a mature Christian is they practice the truth. So we talked about that. We've got to turn our learning into living, that we need to be people that are, as we're, as we're learning from God's word, we're not just going to take it, keep head knowledge, but we're going to translate that into our living. And then so tonight, we're going to talk about the third characteristic of a mature believer, and that is the mature Christian has power over his tongue. <laughs> So, the world's smallest but largest troublemaker, okay? The world's smallest but the, but the largest troublemaker. But it is false, so don't forget those of you that are, um, those of you that are, uh, are uh, joining now, make sure you make post a comment because I always give out gifts. I have like five gifts and I, I, I give out gifts so to the first five people that post comments. And uh, so I want to make sure that, that if you uh, are posting comments, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Roger, if you see someone posted, dish, tell me their name so I can kind of wave out to them. And uh, if someone's posting comments right now, so, uh, but I hope people are posting comments. Um, let, let's pray, okay? God, thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your goodness. And your grace to us. Um, Lord, thank you so much that you've blessed us in, in so many ways today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your presence, Lord, today. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that, uh, that you love us so very much, Lord, that we matter to you, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, um, that you've given us a mouth and you've given us a tongue, Lord, and you've given us the ability to speak, Lord. Um, so let's remember, Father, that tonight that all that you've given us, God, may it bring glory and honor to you, Father. So um, we know that that, that, that that little tiny thing in our mouth can cause a lot of trouble, but we don't want to be troublemakers, God. We want to be, we want to be peacemakers, Lord. We want, to do, uh, we want to do good things, Lord, uh, with all that you've given to us, Lord. And we want to use our body, even our body, Lord, for your glory, God. Thank you so much, Lord, that we can come together, Lord, tonight, Lord, and that we can, we can learn from your word. We give you praise and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Paula Smith. Oh, hey, Paula. Good job. Paula, you were the first one to give a comment, right? That's awesome. So you get you, your fall gift. You're going to love this, Paula. Um, buy four, get one free. It's a coupon for uh, stovetop stuffing turkey. But along with that stovetop turkey, you're going to get... A box of devil's food cakes. Now, don't take that wrong, but you're going to get that. So it'll be here Sunday waiting for you, okay? So, yeah. Isn't that cool? Everybody likes all, everybody likes uh, gifts. And so we're doing thankfulness and thank. And so every every Wednesday night, I'm going to have a crazy gift to give out. So tonight, it's, it's boxes of super moist cake mix, devil food, and plus, you're going to get a coupon for buy, get one free when you buy four of stovetop stuffing turkey amen uh, thanksgiving is right around the right around the corner so we're excited about that um mother Teresa, she said kind words can be short and they can be easy to speak but their echoes are truly endless so it's really powerful to think that that when we speak kind words 
into someone's life that their echoes are endless. They continue to go on and on and on. But in James chapter 3, um, apparently there were some serious problems with, with the tongue. Um, and, and we know in James chapter 1 uh, that he warns us to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Uh, and the believer, he says in James 1.26, that does not bridle his tongue is not truly religious. So what, is, what does that mean when he talks about we're, we're not truly uh, religious? In, in, the, in the Passion Translation in James 1.26, it says this, If someone believes they have a relationship with God, but fails to guard his words, then his heart is drifting. So... When our words are coming out, when they're being, when our words come out negative and, and, and they're critical, then our words, it says something is in our heart, is drifting away and his religion, and when he uses that word religion, we're talking about our relationships with Jesus. He says when, when, you're, when your words are critical and when they're uh, negative, then it reveals something about your heart. So that your heart is drifting away and his religion, his relationship with Jesus is shallow and empty. So I, I think this for me is, is very serious because it, it, it's a warning that we need to make sure that we practice what we preach. That if we don't turn our, we, we need to learn to turn our, our learning of what the Bible teaches about our words and the power of them, turn our learning into living. Because if we don't, then we become a poor reflection of Jesus. So when you read passages like James chapter 4, 1 and, and 11 and 12, you get the impression, by the way, there was this, this church, this gathering, uh, assembly of people and they were having some interesting meetings. Uh, in, in James 4.1, it says, what causes quarrels? So apparently there were some quarrels and, and there were some fights among them. And it says, is it not this that your passions are at war within you? Um, so apparently um, there was some selfishness and self-centeredness. And because of this, there was some quarrels. Um, in, in verse 11 and 12 of James 4, it says, dear friends, as part of God's family, Never speak against another family member. For when you slander a brother or a sister, you violate God's law of love. And your duty is not to make yourself a judge of the law of love by saying that it doesn't apply to you. But your duty is to obey this law of love. Verse 12 goes on to say, There is only one true lawgiver and judge, the one who has the power to save and destroy. So, who do you think you are to judge your neighbor. So the power of speech, by the way, the power of speech is one of the greatest powers God has given us, the way that we speak. As a matter of fact, I can't tell you how many times that I've been moved uh, in so many messages that as I've listened to so many great pastors speak, how their words have encouraged me, how their words have lifted me. Even uh, as I've lis listened to leaders, even the president, as I've li listened to their, their words and their speeches, they have such power in their words. So with the tongue, think about this. Our tongues, we can praise God. We can, we can give thanks to God. We can pray. We can use our tongues to encourage someone. Uh, we can use our tongues to equip someone. We can exhort. We can use our tongue, by the way, one of the most important ways that we can use our tongue is to preach the word. We can also speak life and lead the lost to Christ. So the tongue, uh, the power of speech is one of the greatest powers that God has given us. What a privilege that it is for that we can have this, this power of speech. But with the same tongue, it says, we can tell lies. We can gossip. Uh, we can discourage someone. Uh, it only takes a few words, by the way, to ruin someone's reputation. And even our words, when they come out of our mouth, can, can break someone's heart. Um, it's uh, about twice a year I go to my dentist, Dr. Todd, and he, you know, I always get my teeth cleaned, and he comes in and he does a checkup, makes sure that everything's okay in my, in my, with my teeth and, and my gums and, and my tongue. He, as a matter of fact, he, he always tells me to stick out my tongue, okay, and he grabs it. 
<laughs> Not a very comfortable thing to happen, Dr. Todd, but thank you for doing it. He grabs my tongue, and he checks all around. He checks under it. He checks us on top of it. And what he's doing is he's checking our t my tongue for, like, a disease or maybe even a cancer. And so what we're going to do over these next few weeks is we're going to look at the tongue. We're going to do a tongue check, okay? Yeah. And so, uh, so the ability to speak words is the ability to influence others and accomplish tremendous tasks. And yet, sometimes we don't, for, we, we don't really realize the power and privilege uh, of our speech. And we can sometimes take that for granted. So in order to impress on us, James uh, begins to talk about the importance of controlled speech and the great consequences of our words. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at six pictures of the tongue. He talks about the bit. A bit is what you put in your, in like in a horse's mouth. Um, he talks about the rudder, that little thing that's on the back of a ship. He talks about fire. Um, he talks about a, a poisonous animal. He talks about a fountain uh, and, and, and a fig tree. And all of these six pictures, they, they're, there are three powers of the tongue. So tonight we're going to we're going to begin in James chapter three, and we're going to look at one. Uh, let, we'll look at verses one through four. And, and, and again, I take this word very, very serious because it says, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such, we will incur a stricter judgment. So I, I know that, that God is going to hold me accountable to making sure that I adequately handle or that I represent him and I really study and I do my part to teach. You know, I want to make sure that I teach not just a part of God's word, but I want to teach the whole word, part of word, a uh, whole word. And sometimes it, it even means for me as a preacher and a teacher is that I have to teach the difficult things. I have to say the hard truths of scripture. You can't walk around them because basically I'm going to be, uh, I guess I'm going to be hold with, hold with the stricter judgment. In verse two, it says, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble, by the way, this is this is powerful. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Verse 3 goes on to say, Now if we put the bit into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct the entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So apparently when he talks about this first part, about the body, everybody in the assembly wanted to, they wanted to teach, and, and they wanted to be spiritual leaders, but James says, he gives out this warning. He says, not many of you should act as teachers, my brother, because, you know, there's going to be uh, more accountability. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe um, they were impressed with the authority. Uh, maybe, I don't know, some people like the, like the office, you know, they want to be a teacher. But sometimes they forget about the tremendous responsibility and accountability that goes along with being a teacher. Those who teach the word face, it says, the stricter judgment. So teachers, by the way, must practice what they teach, okay? So if, 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 I'm, if I'm up here talking about being kind and compassionate with my words, and then you find me out at Safeway, you know, being mean to someone with my words, I, I mean, that, I mean, I'm going to be held accountable to not only to you, but also to God. So teachers must practice what they preach. Otherwise, what is it? If, I, if I'm teaching something out of my mouth, but not with my life, what is it? It's called hypocrisy. And, and we, you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be hip, hippers. But this is also true for every believer, for all believers. We, we need to practice what we preach. And, you know, if we talk about the importance of, of being kind and using kind words and, and using our words to encourage and build up people, then we need to make sure that we're practicing what we preach. We must translate our learning into living. We need to have a faith that works. We must not just be hearers of the word, but we need to be doers 
of the word. So James begins to talk about the damage that can be done by a teacher, by the way, who is unprepared or whose spiritual life is not up to par. But teachers are not the only ones who are tempted and sin. It says in James 3, 2, every Christian must admit that we all stumble in many ways. We, uh, James, uh, Romans 3, 23 says, we all fall short of the glory of God. We all have got to admit that this little thing called a tongue in our mouth has gotten away with us. You know, we, we've got to, we got to, we got to all kind of admit that we've said things that, that we, we shouldn't have said. And more importantly, I think as God begins to work through this whole, whole study with us, I think that also as God brings reminders to us of places and people that we have actually been rude with our, our tongues, maybe it's an opportunity for us to go back and say, you know, I'm sorry. I, I spoke some words that weren't kind. Um, I did something with, and, and, and that didn't represent Christ and it didn't represent me well and, and I, I want to ask for forgiveness. Um, so sins of the tongue, by the way, he talks about sins of the tongue. It's like, it's like the head of the list. The person who is able, by the way, he says, to discipline his tongue, James says that when you're able to discipline what comes out of your mouth, that that, that, that is evidence that he can control his whole body. Okay? So he proves that he is mature. He's a mature, perfect man. And that's characteristic number three that we're going to talk about. The mature Christian has power over his tongue. So was James making a mistake by connecting sins of the tongue with sins committed by the whole body? I, I don't think so, because words usually lead to um, deeds. So words usually lead to uh, deeds. So um, in World War II, there was all, you could always read a bunch of posters, and it would say something along this line, loose lips sink ships, okay? Um, but loose lips don't only sink ships, Loose lips also wreck lives, okay? Um, a person makes an unguarded statement, and after you make that statement, you can also find yourself involved in some kind of, of a fight. So his tongue has forced the rest of his body to defend itself. So in, select, in selecting the bit uh, in these verses and the rudder, James begins to present two items that are are, are small, okay? They're small of themselves, yet these two, this bit and this little rudder, it yet exercise, they exercise great power just like the tongue. So a small bit, anybody ever ride horses? Okay, uh, well, it's, it's fun, but with a small bit, you can put it in a horse's mouth and you can control this great, I mean, the horse, I mean, you can control it with what you put in its mouth. A small rudder enables a pilot to steer uh, huge ships. So the tongue is a small member in the body, and yet it has the power to accomplish great things. There, there's life and death in the power of the tongue. I mean, you can, you can really accomplish great things for God. Or you can do hurtful things with your mouth. So a fun fact about the tongue, uh, by, by uh, the average adult man's tongue length is 3.3 is inches, okay? So 3.3 inches. I wish I sh you should, hey, hey, Google for me uh, the longest tongue. See if there's a Genesis, Genesis World War book of record on the yeah. longest tongue. Yeah. Um, and then the, 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 then the average adult woman's tongue length is 3.1 inches. So that's just a, a little fun fact. Do we have a, do we have a, the longest tongue yet? No, we'll find it, right? So uh, both the bit and the rudder must overcome, okay, contrary forces, okay? So um, the bit put in the horse's mouth, it has to overcome the wild nature of the horse. And, and then the rudder it's got to fight the winds and the currents that would want to take the ship and drive it off its course. But the human tongue also must overcome contrary forces. you got to remember that there's a battle against the flesh and the spirit. 
Paul said, you know, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I shouldn't do, I do, what a wretched man am I. He's talking about this battle that goes on between the flesh and the spirit. And then, there are all of these external circumstances around us that would make us say things we ought not to say. In other words, we kind of like put our, our foot in our mouth. Think about like when you're driving behind someone, okay, in external circumstances, and all of a sudden a car stops quickly in front of you, and you come right up to the rear and you almost hit them. Think about all the things that come out of your mouth, and it's an external circumstance that causes you to say things. Did you find something? 3.97 inches, say 4 inches. Oh, so 4 inches is the longest time. Well, that, that, I was thinking like maybe 12 or... <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a so, kiss. But there, there, are, there are circumstances around us that would make us say things we ought not to say. And um, I always say that, you know, those are the things where we need to, to you know, we put our, put our foot in our mouth. Um, sin on the inside... And then pressure on the outside are seeking to get control of our tongue. So this means that both the bit and the rudder must be under the control of a strong hand. The expert horseman keeps the mighty power of the steed under control with this bit. And the expert pilot courageously steers the ship through the storm. So here's the key. When Jesus Christ, when Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, when Jesus Christ controls our tongue, then we, then we need not fear saying the wrong thing or even saying the right things in the wrong way. So it's, it's all about letting Jesus control your tongues and making sure that whatever comes out of your mouth would be something that Jesus is. Have you ever thought about that? Getting up in the morning as you're, as you're making your prayers and your petitions before God. Have you ever thought about just in the morning saying, Lord, I know that it's so important for me to say the right things with my mouth. So Lord, help me in all the things I say to make sure that I say things that bring glory and honor to you. Because Proverbs 18, 21 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life. So with my tongue, I can bring death. I can, I can literally kill someone yep. with my words. But then there are also life is in the power of the tongue. It was, it was interesting. I had a, a beautiful opportunity last night to have dinner with one of our young college. Well, actually, she's a career in health, young man. But it was a great opportunity to catch up and, and, and just laugh again. But, but, but one of the things I loved about having that opportunity is to be able to, to speak into people's lives and tell them that God loves them and that God has a plan and a purpose for life. And I mean it. I mean it's the truth. And I, I'm so thankful that we can speak life in our words. Um, David said this. He said, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. <laughs> keep the door of my lips. In other words, Lord, keep, I don't know, some, some of us need a, to have a deadbolt and probably three padlocks, right? So he probably, that's what he's talking about. Keep the door of my lips. Then he goes on and says, incline not my heart to any evil thing. So God, give me grace to guard my lips from speaking what's wrong. God, give me grace to guard my lips from speaking what is wrong. Guide me away from temptation in doing evil, especially with my mouth. See, David knew that the heart is the key to right speech. He says in Matthew 12, 34, he says, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So, you know, a lot of times when people say things, they say, oh, they'll say, and I, I'm guilty. I'll, I'll say something and I'll go, I didn't really mean that. Well, then you have to ask yourself a question. Well, why did you say that? If you didn't mean something, then right. why did you say it? Yep. David says that the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So what comes out of my mouth really comes out of my heart. See, see for what has been stored up in your heart will be heard in the overflow of your words, okay? 
So whatever comes out of your mouth is coming from your heart. For whatever is in your heart determines what you're going to say. Okay? So that's the reason why it's so important to make sure that Jesus is Lord, right? That He's the King of Kings, that He is the Lord of your heart. So the bit, I'm sorry, important. When Jesus Christ is the Lord of the heart, then He is also the Lord of the lips too, okay? <laughs> he is the Lord of the lips. So the bit and rudder have the power to direct, which means they affect the lives of others. So Wow. That they affect the lives of others. Isn't that a turning point for, for us when we begin to think about that? That in all of our encounters, the people that we come across with every day, uh, the people that we run into, our family members, when we wake up to them, that the bit and the rudder have the power to direct, which means they affect the, the, they affect the lives of our tongue, affects the lives of others. Think about that. The words we speak affect the lives of others. So we can, we, can, we can actually turn someone's bad day into a good day. Or we can turn someone's very good day into a very bad day. A, a judge says, okay, think about this. A judge says guilty or not guilty. And those words guilty or not guilty affect the destiny of a prisoner, but not only that, they affect his family and his friends. Guilty, not guilty. The President of the United States could speak a few words and sign some papers, and there could be, uh, our nation could be at war, or our nation could be at peace. Even a simple yes or no from the lips of a parent can directly or can greatly affect the direction of a child's life. And, and that's so important. You know, what, what kind of words are we speaking into our children's lives? Are we speaking words that bring life? Or do we spring, are we speaking words uh, of death? Are we encouraging our kids? Are we discouraging our kids? Think about our words. We don't think about that very much because we just have a tendency to just talk and let things go, but think about the power of your words. Never underestimate the guidance you give by the words you speak or do not speak. Um, Jesus spoke, by the way, to a woman at a well, and guess what? Her life was changed forever, but that life, her life was changed, but not only her life, but think about it her neighbor's life because so when Jesus spoke into that woman's life it changed her life and it changed her neighbor's life so think about what you have the power in your words when you begin to speak life into people's lives then not only are you speaking life into their lives but then they have an opportunity to affect someone else's life so Peter by the way Peter um, he preached at Pentecost and his words, when he spoke, uh, salvation came out. And there were about 3,000 souls that were won to Jesus that day because of, of his words. Think about that, 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 that your words, that when you share God's word, it has so much power. As a matter of fact, it will not return void. God's word, when it goes out, I, that's the reason why I love the word of God. When I get to teach it, I know that it's going to go out and it's not going to come back void. I know that God, someone's going to use God, someone's going to hear this word and it's going to change their heart. So the tongue has the power to direct others to the right choice. Okay, now there's a, a, a guy named um, uh, Dwight L. Moody. And uh, he was actually working in a Boston shoe store one day. And there was a guy named Edward Kimball. Um, and basically what happens is that uh, this guy begins to talk to Dwight L. Moody, and uh, he leads him to Christ. And then, think about this, Dwight L. Moody, he was one of history's greatest evangelists. Think about the, the power of your words, and think about how you can help people to make the right choices. So, I mean, that is, again, what a privilege. Uh, what, what a responsibility. And the thing is, one of, uh, one of history's greatest evangelists, Dwight L. Moody, I mean, his ministry still continues. See, it would do us all good to 
Uh, by the way, if you want a good book uh, to read on, on words, the book of Proverbs. Read through the book of Proverbs and, and to, to note especially the many references to speech. In Proverbs 15.1, are you ready for this? A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So what do we, what do we learn just from that one little verse in Proverbs 15? If you and I, if someone is speaking harsh to us, if we respond gently when we are confronted, what's going to happen is we're going to diffuse the rage of another. Okay? So when someone's coming at you with anger, we need to, we need to respond gently when we are confronted. Because what happens is when we respond gently, it, it diffuses the rage uh, of another. Um, if we respond, by the way, in the opposite with a sharp cutting word, guess what's going to happen? It just escalates things and it makes things worse. I think, you know, I think, you know, take Jesus as our best example. Even when he was going through the crucifixion, so many times he would, I mean, he would respond gently. And, and, he, and there were many times when Jesus would say nothing at all, not out of weakness, but out of strength. I mean, think what would have happened if Jesus would have really opened up his mouth and spoke. I mean, he could have called 10,000 angels at any time, you know? But he, I mean, he responded gently. And that's something that we need to see. So when, when we respond gently, when we're confronted, we, we diffuse the rage of another. But if we respond with sharp, cutting words, you're just going to make things worse. But, but then there's a third thing, I think. If we respond in anger, guess what? It ruins your testimony. When, when you respond in anger, um, I mean, even if you're the wisest of all men, but when you begin to respond in anger, it, 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 um, it ruins your testimony. Proverbs 12, 22 says, The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in those who tell the truth. Um, Proverbs 10, 19, it says, if you keep talking, <laughs> have you ever been around someone that just keeps talking and talking and talking? I'm not talking about your pastor, by the way, okay? If you keep talking, it won't be long before you're saying something really wrong. Prove your whys from the very start. Just bite your tongue and be strong. Bite your tongue. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because my mom used to always... I mean, when, when she would see, like, you know, I had four brothers, and I mean, when we'd start, we'd start getting at it, you know, and, and she'd say, bite your tongue, you know, because you're going to say something, and you're going to regret it, and, and the truth of it is, you do regret it sometimes, um, so the tongue, James said, is like a bit, the tongue is like a rudder, and it has the power to direct. So how important, now think about this, so we're in the middle of the week, it's Wednesday, let's take all of this to heart and say, and remember what we're learning tonight. How important it is that our tongues direct people in the right way, okay? We wanna make sure our tongues are directing people in the right way. That means that we're going to use our tongues for good and for God's glory. So that's tonight. That's tonight. Uh, the world's smallest but largest troublemaker is the tongue, okay? I want you to think about that. Uh, 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 so that's part one. Uh, the tongue has power to direct. It's the bit in the rudder. And so then next week we're going to look at um, part two. It's the power to destroy. And so the two things that he uses is the fire and the animal. Um, and if we have time, we may even go through the third part, and that's the power to delight. And he talks about the fountain and, and the tree. So, yes, the tongue is like a bit in a rudder. It has the power to direct. And so, Lord, help our tongues be used to direct people in the right way. Help us, Lord, to be people that use our words to encourage lift, um, even correct, admonish. I mean, 
just because you have to be stronger with someone, it doesn't mean that your words can't have power because sometimes those words have got to be spoken. So, but, but whatever you speak, make sure it's done with the power of the Holy Spirit and in kindness and truth and in love. Amen? Because whatever comes out of our mouth, you know, it's life or death. And so think about that, especially when you're, uh, you know, hey, you know, if you're having struggle with somebody, maybe you just have to step back away from someone. And, uh, but it has power, the power, the little tongue, three, uh, three and a quarter or three and a half, depending on if you're a man or a woman, uh, you know, little, little thing in our mouth, but it has so much power. So I, I pray tonight that God will use all of your words um, to encourage, to build, to live, lift, and also the power of words to give uh, good direction to help people to move in a good direction. Amen? So thank you again for joining me uh, for this study tonight. I am I'm so excited about all that God has been, been doing and He continues to, to do as we study through uh, the book of James. Do we have another person that responded? Oh, Richard, did you, did you make a comment? So you get a box of... <laughs> yeah. Not yet, not yet. Yeah. <clears throat> and Pedro. Who? Pedro. Oh, hey, Pedro. Yeah, he had, he had work tonight. Don't forget to get your box of uh, cake mix on Sunday, Pedro. Yeah, oh, crap. All right, awesome, guys. Well, let, let, me, uh, let me say a prayer in closing. Um, but I do want to remind you again, ccnchurch.org is our website. ccnchurch.org is our website. So um, if you have any questions about upcoming events or things that are happening, um, we're just starting to get, we're just really excited about what God has planned for us this fall. And uh, we believe God has plans and his purposes. And we're just going to continue to pray every every uh, uh, Sunday night at 5 p.m. We have a gather, we have intercessors that gather and pray. We want to encourage anybody that wants to, to come and join us. It's a great opportunity to just pray and see God's face. Um, ccnnazoffice at gmail.com ccnnaz N-A-Z office at gmail.com uh, If you have questions uh, if you have prayer requests uh, if you have uh, needs or if you have someone that has a need um, if there's someone we can serve you you want to tell us, like for instance if you want to respond and, and let me know how God was dealing with you tonight as far as you know, things you were learning as we were studying scripture together about how important our, our words are um, just let us know at ccnnazoffice at gmail.com um, we have two services on Sunday, 9 a.m. and 10.30 uh, a.m. We do live stream the second service at 10.30 a.m., but remember, both of those services are live. So please come, uh, join us. We have got everything nice and clean. Um, we do have a children's ministry during our second service at that 10.30 um, hour. And uh, I think that pretty much covers it all. Uh, oh, there is a, a serve Saturday. This Saturday, um, it begins at 7, and it goes till 10. And so if you are free for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, or three hours, uh, we still have some things around the church that need to be finished up. So we would love for you to come and be a part of that on Saturday. Uh, it's between 7 and 10 a.m. in the morning. And, uh, yeah, I think that's all. Amen? Lord Jesus, thank you so much. For your love and your goodness. Lord, I'm just, I, I'm remembering right now, Father uh, Peter, and um, it's after the crucifixion and after the resurrection, and uh, he and his buddies are on a boat, they're fishing, and uh, Jesus is coming to the shore. And then after a while, people, the disciples realize that it's, 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 um, it's Jesus. And I'm pretty sure that Peter was probably in some ways kind of concerned because he denied him. And they all ran away. And now, they're, now they're, they're getting ready to face the Savior. And in their minds, they're probably, they're probably thinking that, that he's going to be like 
he's going to like discourage them and, and tell them, you know, like, why did you leave me? And, and, and why did you, why didn't you help me? And, but what they found when they came to the Savior was totally the opposite. He told, G, he told Peter, he said, he asked him, do you love me? And then he began to ask him, well, feed my sheep, you know, feed my lambs. So instead of ridicule and, and, and discouraging him, he, he just reconfirmed, you know, hey, Peter, I love you. I want you to know that, but do you love me? And, and so tonight, you know, you may have that fear of coming to Jesus because maybe you're that person. Maybe you've, maybe you've turned against God. Maybe you turned against Jesus. Maybe you haven't been following him. Maybe, maybe you're, you're realizing that your words haven't been like Jesus's. And, but I want you to know that just as those guys came to, to Jesus that day and, and received good words, I want you to know that you matter to God. And that as you come to him, his words are going to be words of love and encouragement. He's going to, he's going to want to show grace on your life. And, and he, wants, he wants your life to be turned around. He wants, he wants you to be a person that loves him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And also you love your neighbors yourself. But also that your, your life and your words would be a reflection of him. And God says that he will help you if you'll trust him. Thank you, Jesus, for loving us. Thank you for being with us tonight. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I, we shall see you on Sunday at 9 or 10.30 a.m. Be blessed.